Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me in this course. My name is Heath Adams, and I'm going to be your instructor for the next three or so hours. So a little bit about me. I am the owner and CEO at TCM Security. We focus on cybersecurity and primarily what is known as ethical hacking. So organizations pay us to hack into them and try to find vulnerabilities before the bad people do. And a lot of that does involve using coding and being able to run our own scripts and manipulate code and use that in exploitation. And so I have taken my passion for teaching and put that into this course. I've taught a lot of courses before. I've taught Python before, uh, but I've never taught a full introductory level Python course. And I love to give away education for free on YouTube. So uh, here we are in this course. If you're interested in learning more about cybersecurity or educational training in that space, we have a ton of free content on our YouTube channel, and we also have our TCM Security Academy, which you can see the link there below as well. And we've got 12 or so courses at the time of this video, ranging from entry-level ethical hacking courses to Python courses for ethical hackers to malware analysis and forensics courses and some really cool stuff out there. So if you're like me with a passion for coding and cybersecurity, it's really the best of both worlds. So please do consider checking out the sites, but most importantly, please do consider dropping a like and subscribing to this channel. We are really trying to push and make it towards a million subscribers and we are well on our way. And I would love to have you as a subscriber if you find the content worthy. So with that brief introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with this course. So briefly, here's what we're going to cover. It's a lot of topics that we're going to go over in the next three hours. We're going to talk about strings and variables and methods and functions and Boolean expressions and different types of looping, for loops, while loops, dictionaries, lists, sockets. We're going to build a port scanner. We're going to talk about classes and objects and how to take user input and how to read and write files and all this fun stuff. And maybe none of this makes sense to you. So I'm not going to really harp on it right now, but hopefully by the end of all this, all these things will make sense to you. So let's go ahead and move into installing the materials that we need in order to get Python running. And then we're going to start coding pretty soon. All right, so in order to run Python, we need to download it. Now, if you're running on Linux or a Mac, chances are Python's already installed for you. So you should double check that before going out and downloading it. But if you go to python.org and you go to the download section here, you have the option to download it here. So I am running on Windows. It automatically detects what your operating system is. And you could just come in here and quite literally just hit download Python. So I've done that. It downloaded an executable for me. You actually have the options here for Windows, Linux, Mac, and other. So depending on what operating system you're on, then that is what you're going to run. In this instance, all I have to do is open up the executable that I downloaded. And I'm going to come in here for Windows and I'm going to just say install the launcher and add Python 3.10 to path. And I'll just say installed now, and that will install for me. And it's going to ask me if I want to allow this to make changes. I'm going to say yes. You're going to follow very similar instructions if you're following along on a Mac or other operating system. Now, I am going to show you how to set this up. But throughout this course, I'm actually going to be running on Linux because that's how I prefer to use Python. But I'm going to show you how you can operate this without having to download a virtual machine or how to do it the way I'm doing it. I'm just very familiar and used to running it in the way that I'm going to be showing it in the course, but you're going to be able to follow along with the instructions that I'm setting you up with as well. So while this is setting up, you have a few options for text editors or what are called IDEs. So an IDE is an integrated development environment, and it basically allows you to code in an environment that is intuitive and can auto-complete your code for you and can detect errors in your code and has a lot of great functionality automatically built into it because it's made for coding. So PyCharm is a great IDE. 
you can go to jetbrains.com forward slash pie charm or just google pie charm and go to the downloads page again there is a windows mac os and linux options all you got to do is come here and download the community edition for this and then you're going to run that as well now my setup for python was complete so we're good there i'm going to go ahead and install pycharm that i've downloaded and i'm going to talk about a couple of other options as well so you do not have to use an ide and in this course i'm not going to be using an ide i'm just going to be using a text editor i'm actually going to be using a text editor called mousepad which is colorful it does okay it's not too bad but i'm going to be using that but i would recommend using an ide if you can um, when you're going through this installation for PyCharm, by the way, all you have to do is just click next. And then when you come in here, you can create associations if you want. So like you can do dot pi associations, which I do recommend. You can create a community desktop or a shortcut here for the community edition, and you can add the bin to the path. I think that you should do that as well. Uh, and then you just hit next and install and just let that run. Now, these other text editors like Sublime, Sublime's a great text editor, very pretty. It's got good colors. It's just not an IDE. So it's something that is not intuitive, but it still can detect that you're writing in code and is very, very visually pleasing. Um, another one is Notepad++. I use this. It's only for Windows, but I think it's pretty decent. Um, and then I'll show you my environment really quick. So when I'm running in Linux, and this is our final project that you're looking at here, but when I run in Linux, I run like this and I just run in mouse pad and I just come in here and I type things out. It's still very color organized and color coordinated so I can see where I'm making mistakes at. But again, it's not an IDE. So I will come in here, I will open this up and then I will execute the code within this area. So as you follow along and you see me typing and executing code. I'm using two specific areas to do that. But I'm going to show you how you can do that all in one location with PyCharm. So you might need to reboot your computer. I'm going to go ahead and say I'll manually reboot later. All right, so now PyCharm is opened. I did not actually need to reboot, by the way. So we can go ahead and come in here and just hit New Project. And you can select where you want your project to be located. And you can select your environment. I'm just going to use the virtual environment. Make sure that you're using your base interpreter of Python 3. Currently, we're on 3.10. And so all of this looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and just hit Create. All right, and it's going to create this for us. And now, just to make sure this is working, you can see in here that we have a main.py project. If you want to come in here and use this, you can just right click say new and file and then you can just name the file what you want like you can name this test.py and when you want to run your file so once you save your file and you want to run it so let's say this main here all we have to do is come up here and hit run run main and down below it will say what it's doing so you can see it says hi pycharm we had a print statement in here that says hi pycharm so this is doing exactly what we wanted to do so as you follow along, you have the option to follow along in here. If you see me create a file, just create a file. If you see me run the program, all you have to do is come in here and run the program. Now, if you are familiar with Linux or familiar with Mac and you want to run it the way that I'm doing it, that's perfectly acceptable as well. So just as a heads up, don't freak out just because I'm in a different environment. It's just what I'm the most comfortable with. But the PyCharm IDE is probably the best way to go if you're a brand new beginner because it's all in one. You don't have to do anything um, back and forth or use any other operating system you're not comfortable with. So I'm giving you the flexibility of options here. So from here, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to get into coding and we're going to have a really great time. So I'm so excited to get into this. So I'll catch you over in the next lesson as we start working with strings. Okay, on to our first lesson. The first thing that we're going to cover is going to be strings. And in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and make a directory on my Linux machine. You can make a folder in your Mac or your Windows machine if you're using those operating systems. 
I'm just going to go in here and just say make dir python and then I'm going to go ahead and go into that directory. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and make my first script. So I'm going to clear my screen with control L and I'm going to say mouse pad and I'm just going to call this script first.py and I'm going to give it the ampersand here at the end. That's just going to allow me to open up this process of mouse pad and also have the terminal available to me when I need it. So you'll see why I do that here in a little bit. Now, if you're not on Linux, that's okay. You can use something like Notepad++ or Code Runner for Mac, which we showed earlier in this course. So from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and enter in a shebang, which is a hash and an exclamation, forward slash bin, forward slash Python 3. And this is important for Linux here because we are calling out the directory. If you are familiar with Linux, what's happening here is we have two options. We can come in here and we can say Python 3 and we can say first.py and that'll execute our script. Or in theory, we can come in here, we can just do a dot forward slash first.py and run it that way. If we run it like this, our script will not know where to go unless we declare that. So up here, we're giving the shebang forward slash bin forward slash Python 3. That is where Python 3 is located in this machine. So it will come up here and it will look for this first and say, OK, I'm going to execute this based on Python 3. So that is a little bit of a Linux nuance here and something you should know in case you are ever coding in Linux or an environment that is similar like Unix, which Macs do run off of. So from here, if you've ever taken a coding class, the first thing you do in every single coding class is what is known as hello world. So we're going to print out hello world and print it to our terminal. So in order to do that, we're going to go ahead and do something like this. We're going to say print and then we'll do a parentheses and we'll say hello world. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And if we run this, and I'm going to run this with Python 3, if we run this, Python 3 first.py, you'll see that it says, hello world. Now, one thing that we can do in here is good practice for being a developer is add some notes in. So we're going to add a comment in here. We're going to do a hashtag or a pound symbol, and we're just going to say print string. Now, when we run this again, this isn't going to print out. Comments are just for us inside of the script. And I can prove that to you by saving this and running it again. You'll see all we have in here is hello world. Perfect. So comments with a hash are just meant for whoever is reading your script or your code. And that could be you or bad scenario. But what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? You're the main developer. And nobody knows how to read your code because you didn't leave any comments. That'd be very bad. So good coding practice suggests to leave good comments and make sure that people can come in and read your code and understand what is going on in here. So we're going to add comments along the way. So that way we understand what we're doing and practice good habits as well. So what you're seeing here is what's called a string. You're seeing a string in quotations and you can see a string printed out with single quotes as well. So we can just do hello world. I'll add the exclamation for consistency. And if we save this and print this, you'll see that it also prints hello world. So it really doesn't matter if you have single quotes or double quotes until we get into more advanced strings. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on in the course. But for now, just know that you can use single quotes or double quotes when printing out a string. Another thing that we can do with strings is print on multiple lines. So if we say print and we do triple quotes like this, we say this string runs and then we hit enter multiple lines with an exclamation and and add in three more double quotes there and close this off. We can add a note here as well that says triple quote for multi line. And if we save this with control S and we run this again, you're going to see this string runs multiple lines. Awesome. Another thing that we can do is concatenate strings. 
So we can print out something like this string is, and now we're gonna add a space at the end of it. Make sure you have a space right here. We're gonna do a plus sign, and then we're gonna say awesome. Just like that. And we can say we can also concatenate. It's always hard for me to spell that. So what's gonna happen here is it's gonna take this string plus this string when it prints out. So the reason we have a space is it's got to have the space because there's no space here and this won't just add a space for us even though in our heads we might want it to. So we're going to go ahead and save this, print it out one more time, and you can see that it concatenated and said this string is awesome. Now, one last thing. We can also print out a new line. So we can just do something like this. And we can use a single quote this time just to do a proof of concept. Do a backslash n like this. And this will print out a new line. And we'll get familiar with that later on. As we get into functions, we'll write our own function to make a new line. But for now, if we wanted to add another line, we could. And then we can just print test that new line out. And let's see if it actually gave us a line printed in between this concatenation and this new print statement here. So let's go ahead and save that. We'll print it. And you can see there is a line here. So the backslash n will print out a new line for us. And that is all we need to know for basic string. So we're going to go ahead and move on to math. You can go ahead and leave this open. We're going to run through this as we go and then you'll have a long script which will also make for very good notes let's go ahead and move on to math so math python actually has a built-in math interpreter so we can do a bunch of fun stuff with python and with math that's automatically built in so I'm going to go ahead and just call this section math. And if you want to like keep track of sections, you can come up here and just call this strings and just capitalize it like that. And then that way we kind of have an idea of where we're at. You can even add an extra uh, line here if we want to. So from here, let's go ahead and play around with math just a little bit. So if I wanted to do a print of 50 plus 50, we can definitely add. We can also subtract. So if you want to do 50 minus 50, you could do that. And I'll give you some time to catch up here in just a second. I'm just going to do a few print statements, then we'll take a look at them, and then we'll move on to some more math as well. We can also do 50 times 50. And we'll just use the little star or the asterisk. We'll just say multiply. And we'll also do 50 divided by 50. We'll just say divide. So if we save that, you could take a second to catch up. You could see we are just doing simple math here. We should expect 100. We should expect 0. We should expect 1 here and 2,500 if my math is mental math is correct. So I'm going to go ahead and print this out. OK, and we've got 100, 0, 2,500, and 1.0. So this 1.0 is a little bit different. This is what's known as a float. Everything else that has come out so far is just an integer. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a few minutes. But know that integers are on the left-hand side. And if we don't have a decimal point here, we're looking at integers. And on the right-hand side, when we see anything on the right-hand side of the decimal, we're looking at what is called a float. And that becomes very important depending on when we need it. For now, we're going to keep worrying about math. We'll get into integers and floats in just a little bit. So another thing that math built into Python can do is it can do PEMDAS. If you've never heard of PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. You may have had something different within your educational experience, but it will do that for you. So if you do 50 plus 50 minus 50 times 50 divided by 50, it will give you the answer. 
I don't know that mental math offhand. Another thing that we can do are exponents. So we can print, say, 50 to the second power, which is the same thing as 50 times 50, which would be 2,500 as well. And we can get exponents out of this. And we'll actually go ahead and save this and run this here because the next stuff I want to be able to lay out clearly. So you can see that we have successfully done the math here, did it for us, awesome. And it also did the exponent for us as well. So now a couple of weird things with division. So you saw the 1.0 before. Well, we have a few things that we can do. For example, the 50 divided by six, but using a percentage sign is what's called a modulo. And that it just takes what is left over. So 50 divided by six is not divisible. There is a leftover. So if we print that, you'll see we get a leftover of two, which makes sense because six goes into 58 times. Six times eight is 48. And then we have two left over. So if we want to know what the remainder is, we can use a percentage sign here. We can also do something like 50 divided by six, like we saw earlier. And this will have division with remainder. So we can say, or, or float. We'll save that and take a look at that really quick. You can see we get 8.3 and then it rounds up eventually to a four. And lastly, what if we wanted no remainder? So if we just did 50 divided by six, we say no remainder. We could do this and we should get eight here. So depending on the situation and what we want, we might want a situation where we only want the integer or we only might want what's left over, or perhaps we actually want the whole number of what's being divided. So there are a few different ways to divide with math in Python, and it's good to know all of them depending on the situation that you run into. So for now, just take notes on this and know that there are a few ways to do math and division, and you can do PEMDAS and exponents and all kinds of fun stuff. And this is just scratching the surface of math with Python. So that's it for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one, which is going to start covering variables and methods. So I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to call this section variables and methods. And if we want to make our script a little bit clean, we can just come in here and copy this new line. It'll be a lot easier once we write a function for this, but we haven't gotten there quite yet. So we're going to print out this new line. And that way, when we print this out, you could see that we have kind of gaps in between the sections that we're working on. So now we're going to work on variables and methods. So variables, variable means something can vary. It can change. And we're going to look at that here in a second. So if we have something like quote, and we make quote equal to all is fair and love and war. And this is what this is a string. We are storing this string inside of this variable called quote. And we can just come in here now and we can print out quote. And if we do that, we should get this returned back to us. You can see all is fair and love and war. If we didn't print this, just go ahead. Actually, we'll just comment this out. This is a great way to test the script. If we just save this now with a comment and we hit enter, there's nothing here. We haven't given it any instructions to actually print out. So now we can print this out and it's printing whatever is stored inside of that variable. In this instance, we have a string stored in there. Now, when we talk about methods, methods are just functions that are available for a given object. Now you could think of functions as something built into Python that allows us to do something. And it'll make sense here when we get into using methods. So we have this quote, all is fair in love and war. 
Well, what if we wanted to print this in a few different ways? Well, we can use methods to do that. For example, we can print quote in uppercase and just do upper like that. And this is going to make it all uppercase because we're giving it this period upper and then open close parentheses right here. And that is allowing us to use that method. So we can say uppercase and we can also print in lowercase. We do lower. And just for one more, we can also do print and we'll say quote dot title. And this is what's known as title case and title case will capitalize every single letter like it is the title uh, in this instance here. We're going to get like the A capitalized, which wouldn't really be true in a title, but still just know that title case is meant to capitalize every first letter within your string or your sentence. In this case, we're going to call this lowercase here. OK, so let's go ahead and save this and we're going to print this out. And you can see the differences that we have. We have it here in its normal quote, and then we have it in uppercase, all lowercase, and then every single first letter capitalized. Perfect. These are methods. These are just a small example of methods. We're going to get into more a little bit later. Here's another example. What if we wanted to print the length of quote? Let's say we wanted to know how many characters we're within this sentence. So this is going to count the characters. And this will also count spaces. So we're trying to get a total count of what's going on inside this string. We print that. You'll see that we get 28 return. So if you want to check that, you can go count every single character within here and you'll get the length of that. And that could become important as you're doing Python later on. And this is just yet another example of a method. Now let's go back to looking at variables and why they're called variables. So let's say that we have a variable of a name. And in this instance, I'm going to use my name and I'm going to make it a string. And I'm going to use my age. I am 33. And here we're going to say string just so we can make sure we notate the differences. This is an int or an integer. And we're also going to give a GPA. Let's say I went to school and I'm going to use the American grading system. Let's say I had a 3.7 GPA and this is what's known as a float. And that has a decimal. So make sure you notate that. So if we print these out, if we print out the integer of age. That'll still print. 33. What if we print out the integer of 30.1? Save that. Take a look. And you'll see that we just get 30. All right. And you can see that this rounded down again, integer, just the first number, just what's on the left side of the decimal point. Doesn't care about the right side. What if we printed integer of 30.9. Will it round? Will it round? No. So if we save that and we print again, you'll see it's still 30. It doesn't care what's on the right side of the number. It's only going to take what the integer is. So anytime you print an integer, you're only going to get the first or what's on the left hand side of the decimal point. So make sure you know that. Now, a few cool things that we can do. Let's say that we wanted to print something like this. If we print my name is with a space and then we'll do plus name. And we'll say space again and I am space age plus space years old. Make sure you have your spacing in there properly. That way you can account for the spaces before and after these variables. But what are we doing here? We are concatenating variables. Now, if I try to run this, I'm actually going to get an error. If I run it. We're getting a type error. 
And this is a great example, by the way, of understanding what Python is telling you. I get emails all the time from students saying, I don't understand why my script isn't working. And the first thing I'll ask them is I will say, did you read the output of the error? Because it tells you, it says, hey, on line 44, if I control tab, look, this is line 44. It tells you where your mistake is. And then it also says, it only concatenate string, not int to string. So if you didn't know what this meant, and maybe you don't, you can copy this, go to Google and search it. And I promise you, somebody will have had this error before. As much as we wish to be special, uh, there's not in many situations that will come up where there hasn't been this error or an issue that we run into that somebody hasn't already had before. So with that in mind, we can fix this. So it's saying that it can only concatenate strings, not integers. Well, name is a string, but age is an integer. So we need to make in this situation, age a string. So what we're going to do is just say str like this and give it like that. And now if we print this, save it, print it. You can see my name is Heath and I am 33 years old. Perfect. Now, what happens if I am a year older? Well, I could take age and do something like plus equals one, something like that. And if I print age now, hopefully we are seeing 34. And you can see 34. Now, this is what comes into play. This is a variable. Variables can change. At this point in the script, we define that we are 33. And as we run through it, I am still 33 when I print this statement out. However, I've had a birthday now. Age has increased by one. Printing age out now will say that I'm 34. So variables can change. Variables can store different numbers at different times. That's why they are called variables, because they vary. Now, we could also do something like birthday and set birthday equal to one. And I could say age plus equals birthday and then print age. And guess what? Now it's going to return 35. So just know that you can store a number within a variable. We've shown that before already. We can add two integers together and we can print them out. So we're adding those together and it's taking that total and adding that to age. And now it's saying we're 35 years old. So that is it for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and move on to functions and fix this new line issue that we've had, plus write some pretty cool stuff out and build some other cool functions out as well. So I'll go ahead and see you over in the next lesson. All right, moving on to functions. So let's go ahead and print out a new line really quick. And we're going to call this functions. Now, I like to think of functions as mini programs. What they are is an organized block of code that you define, and then you can call it later instead of repeatedly typing the code out. So we're going to take a look at some examples of that. So let's go ahead and write a function. So let's do a define def. And that's how we start a function. And in this one, I'm going to say, who am I? And I'm going to do close parentheses. And here we're going to say, this is a function without parameters. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Now, indentation is incredibly important in Python. If we do not indent, we will throw an error here. And you're going to see a lot of situations where indentation becomes incredibly important. It's one of the most important things in Python. Python does not have a lot of rules that apply to it, but indentation is one of them that you must follow. So we're going to go ahead and hit the tab to indent. And I'm going to say my name is Heath. And this is what is known as a local variable. We'll talk about that here in a second as well. 
age is equal to 30. And we're going to go ahead and print. Same thing we did before. We can actually just kind of copy this up here. We'll say my name is just like this. Okay. Copy all that, paste it, and then add the close parentheses there. I'll let you catch up. And then we can just call down here, who am I? So what's going on in here? Well, we have a function that we're defining. We're calling it who am I? And it has no parameters. We'll get into parameters here in just a second. Now we're giving it some items within this. In this instance, what we're doing is we're giving this local variables. We're saying, hey, in this instance, when we have a variable of name, it's going to be Heath and the age is going to be 30. Well, whatever is stored in here is only stored within the function. That's why this is a local variable. If we print age as well, we'll see that. So we know that age was 35. We called age over here as 30 and let's see what happens. First of all, we called our function here. We said, who am I called that? And all it does is run our mini program. Our mini program says, Hey, I'm going to print out these variables into this string here. Okay. And that's exactly what it did. But when we printed age again, you could see that we're actually still 35. So this variable or the variables that are within a function are local and do not apply outside of the function. So make sure to remember that. Okay, so I'm going to delete this print statement. We don't need it. And we're going to write some more functions. So let's do one where we add some parameters. So we're going to do add 100. And we're going to give this a parameter of num, N-U-M. And that's just going to stand for number. Okay, we're going to indent, make sure we indent. And all we're going to do is print num plus 100. So when we call our function, we say add 100, just like last time. This time we have to actually give it what is called an argument. So our argument goes with our parameter here when we're calling it. So our argument is going to be 100. And when we print this out, this is going to be 200, hopefully. So we'll save this, run it. And you can see that we got 200 because we're doing print 100 plus 100. That's all we're doing with this mini program. Okay, let's try another one. Let's say we want to have multiple parameters. Let's do define add, and we're just going to add X and Y. This one's going to be easy. We're just going to say print X plus Y. And now we can add whatever we want. So let's add seven and seven. And one will take the place of X. The other one will take the place of Y. X plus Y, seven plus seven should be 14. Let's go ahead and run that. You'll see we get 14 here. Beautiful. All right, let's make it a little bit more complicated then. All right, let's try adding in here another function. This time we're going to do multiply. We're going to do X and Y again. And instead of doing a print, I want to show you something a little bit different. Let's say we just return X times Y. And now in this instance, if we multiply seven times seven, do we get 49? We don't. Okay. There's a reason for this. This is just calling back. So when this is saying return, this isn't saying print. Remember, this says print. This is going to return X times Y. So we can call this here, this function, and it knows that this function is equal to 49. And perhaps we can put that into something else. Like we could put that maybe into a variable or whatever it is we might want to do with it. However, if we wanted to return to the screen, we actually have to call that. So sometimes we're going to actually store something instead of printing it. We do a lot of printing in Python tutorials just so that you can 
see it on the screen and make sure that you're seeing what you're doing and that everything's printing out okay. So that's why we're doing this, but please understand that the return option does exist and is used quite frequently. So I'm going to save this and run this. And you can see now that we get 49. Perfect. Okay, two more. Let's say we want to do a square root. Okay, so let's define square root. And we're just going to give it one parameter. And in this instance, we're going to print out the square root. So we're going to take x and a square root in exponent format is just to the power of 0.5. That's all we're doing. And we can test that theory by doing something like square root of 64, which we should return as 8, because 8 times 8 is 64. So if we save that, come in here, print it, and you can see we get a float of 8.0. Now, I told you we would create our own function for a new line, and we're going to do just that. So let's go ahead and define new line. And we could call this like new line if we wanted to or whatever. But I think to make it simple, as long as we understand what it is, we can make comments and notes in here if we wanted to. We could just say define NL. And then we can just say that when we do that, we're just going to print out our N for our new line. And then we call a new line. We'll get one. Very simple. So we can just even say in here, new line. Okay, so now we know. And we save that and we can print it. You'll see it. It's here, but we really don't have anything after it to really show it, but we do have that space there. So that is it for this lesson. I'll go ahead and see you over in the next one. Next up, we're going to learn about Boolean expressions and also relational and Boolean operators. So let's go ahead and type in here Boolean expressions. And when we think of these, we can just think of this as true or false. That's really what it is. So from here, let's do a few variables. So we could set bool1 equal to true. We're just going to say, hey, this variable is true. Bool2, we could set equal to 3 times 3 is equal to 9. So the double equals means that something is equal to something. So we have 3 times 3, that's 9. Equal, equal, that means that equals 9. Do not confuse that with setting up your variable. This is saying, hey, my variable is equal to this, but this is saying this is equal equal to this number. And that is a true statement. We could also say bool3 and make that false. Or we can give it a statement that makes it false. So something like 3 times 3 does not equal 9. Exclamation equals means does not equal 9. Now, if we print it out, bool1, bool2, bool3 and bool4 just like that and save it and if we come in here you'll see that it says true true false false again boolean expressions is something true is something false why do we need to know this well we need to know if something is true then we might want to continue on or if something is false we might want to do something and we'll get into that when we get into conditional statements. Like, if something is true, then go ahead and do this. If something is false, do this. Or there's something called while loops, which will allow us to continue as long as something is true. We're going to get there when we get to conditional statements as well, or looping, I should say. And we'll talk about that. But that is why we might want to know these things. Among other stuff, we might want to know if something's true or set that parameter or that variable to true until it becomes false. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So right now, just understand that Boolean expressions are true or false. And we're going to come in here and we're going to print, and we're going to say type, 
and we're going to do bool one. Okay, and this will tell us. Now, this is a nice thing. So if we come in here and say type, it'll give us the class. This class is Boolean. Awesome. And another example of that is if we say like bool five is equal to true and we print the type. So if you see true and you're like, I wonder what that is, is that a Boolean or is it actually just a string? We can come in here and say bool five. We save that, save that there. And then you should see that that class is actually a string here. So you can check with the type to see what is this. Okay, so the type feature is very nice, and we can see that we are dealing with a Boolean here, and this one is actually a string. So please note that if you put it in quotation, that makes it a string. If you leave it like this, that makes it a Boolean expression. Let's go ahead and make a new line, and we're going to talk about relational and Boolean operators. Okay. So we can think of that as, let's make a variable here. We say greater than, we say seven is greater than five. Well, that would be true. And we are using an operator here. So the operator is the greater than sign. We're also using a Boolean expression because it's going to result in a true return if we were to print that out. Now we can do a few other things. We can say like, less than is equal to five is less than seven. We can do greater than or equal to, which would be seven is greater than or equal to seven. That's true. We can also do less than or equal to. And in that case, we can do seven is less than or equal to seven, which is also true. So all of these statements here are true. Now we can get into some other type of operators and statements here. What if we did and? So let's just call this test and we're gonna do test and. We say seven is greater than five. Well, that's true. And five is less than seven. That's also true. Both statements are true, thus, this is true. Do another one. Test and two. And for some students, this does take a little bit to get your head wrapped around. I'm going to provide a table for you here just in a second, but just follow along and I'll explain this as we go. So let's say we have seven is greater than five and five is greater than seven. Sorry, let me fix that syntax. Five is greater than seven. This now becomes false. Why? Well, seven is greater than five and five is greater than seven. That's not true. So because it's not true, because both statements are not true, this becomes false. There's an alternative to this. What if we had an or we said or so seven is greater than five or five is less than seven. Well, both statements are true. Thus, this is true, but we can have the same situation as before where we have seven is greater than five or five is greater than seven. And guess what? This statement is actually true because all we need is one condition to be true for this to be true. So in this situation, this is true or if this is true, then the whole thing becomes true. So just because this is false, this would also have to be false for this to be false. Hopefully that makes sense. One other thing here before I show you the cool little table is we could do test not. So if we said something was not true, guess what? That becomes false. Same thing. If we said it was not false, then it's true. Not is just the opposite. So not true in this situation is false. Now, if we go out to the internet, and we go to Google, we could come in here and we can just search something like Python truth table. And if we go to images, we should be able to find one that works out pretty well in our favor. Here's a good example right here. So if you ever take a coding class, you might be quizzed on this. This will tell you truth tables right here. So if it's not false, 
it's true. If it's not true, it's false. We can look at or statements. So true or false is true. The only situation an or statement becomes false is when both are false. Now the and, we looked at that. If it's true and false, it's false. If it's false and true or false and false, it's still false. Only situation for and where it can be true is when both are true. There's also not or, not and. There is does not equal or equals. So it's good to know these types of truth tables. And you can come and just, again, Google Python truth table and come look up this. Pretty straightforward once you get the hang of it, but it's completely okay for right now for it to be confusing. Just wanted you to know that these are out there and exist in case you are a little bit confused by this lesson. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next lesson, which is going to cover conditional statements. Okay, we'll come in here, we'll do a new line, and we'll just say conditional statements. And we can think of this as if, then, or if, then, else, or if, else. Either way you want to write this, this is fine. So think about this. If you go to the store and you want to buy a drink, and that drink is $2. If you have $2 or more, you can buy the drink. If you do not have $2, you will not be able to buy the drink. So let's take a look at that. So if we write a function and we call it define drink, and we give it a parameter of money, we come in here and we say, if money is greater than or equal to two, then we're gonna return Look at the indentation again. We need an indent here after our function and we need an indent after our if statement. So make sure you're indenting correctly. Return, you've got yourself a drink. And here, if we come back, we can say else, we're gonna return no drink for you. Kind of like Seinfeld, no soup for you. All right, so if we come in here and we print drink of three, meaning we had $3 at the time, and we print drink of one, meaning we had $1 at the time, we're gonna have two different results. If we have two or more dollars, we're gonna return, you've got yourself a drink. Otherwise, if we have less than $2, we're gonna say no drink for you. So let's save that. You've got yourself a drink when we print out $3 because we had enough money. Here you can see with $1, we did not have enough money, thus no drink for us. Okay, let's take a look at a little bit more of a complicated one. We're gonna come in here, we're gonna say define. Now, I'm going to make this alcoholic beverages. If you do not drink, that's okay. You can just follow along still. You can change it into whatever you want to be. But I think this is a good example because we have a couple of parameters and we can use those to make different sort of conditional statements. So let's define alcohol. Now in the United States, we have two things that we need in order to purchase alcohol. One, we have to be old enough. We also have to have enough money, similar to the drink before that was non-alcoholic, we assume. Well, we have to actually be old enough to purchase this drink. In the United States, you have to be 21. So if our age is greater than or equal to 21, let me put a space here, by the way, sorry. And, uh, look, the and is coming into play. Money is greater than or equal to five. Then we're going to return. We're getting a drink. All right, now we're going to say else if, because there's a few situations that we can be in. There's actually four situations here. So we're going to say ELIF, which stands for else if. What happens if our age is greater than or equal to 21 and we don't have enough money? So we say money is less than five. Well, in that situation, we're going to return 
come back with more money. Okay, and then what if we have another situation where we say age is less than 21 and we actually have money. We're just an underage person trying to buy a drink and we say $5. Well, we're gonna return. Nice try, kid. And then lastly, if we have no monies and we're not old enough, well then we can just return something like you're too young and too poor. Okay, and then let's try these out. So we've got these different situations here again. Okay, if we have our age and money, we meet both criteria, we're getting a drink. Otherwise, if we meet the age but no money, let's come back with more money. If we don't meet the age but we have the money, nice try, kid. And then lastly, if you don't have the money and you're not old enough, you're going to be too young and too poor. So we're going to print out a few different statements here of this function. So let's give it 21 and 5. We'll print alcohol again of 21 and 4. Print alcohol of 20 and 5. And these should all meet different criteria, alcohol of 20 and 4. So we should expect to get these in order. We meet what we need here. We don't, we don't, we don't. Different criteria for each of these. So we'll save this, go ahead and run this. And you can see it says no drink for you. Actually, that's the last one. Uh, we're getting a drink, come back with more money. Nice try kid and you're too young and too poor. So you can see that we can make conditional statements based on everything that we're starting to put together here. We have now used a function, we've used multiple parameters, we've used a conditional statement, we've used relational operators, okay? We've got the Boolean, right? This is true and true, we're returning something. This is true and true in this situation, then we're gonna return something else. So we have different situations that can come back. So we need to meet those criteria and we're starting to use that. Look, we're using the return instead of the print feature. There's a bunch of different things that we're doing here that's all starting to tie in. And hopefully that's starting to make sense why we do things. We're starting to build upon it and it's starting to get a little bit more fun. So from here, we're going to go ahead and move on to lists and move on with our journey into Python. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Let's move on to lists. So let's go ahead and do our new line and we'll call it lists. And the best way to think of lists, in my opinion, is that they have brackets, something like this. Now lists are data structures. They are changeable. We can reorder them. They are basically just a group of elements. Now, everything within a list is called an item. And as I mentioned, the best way to think about lists is that they have brackets. Just like a string might have quotes around it, lists will have brackets around it. Now, again, we need to remember these are changeable. We'll talk about something here in a little bit that is not changeable, which is called a tuple. Now here, let's go ahead and declare a list. We're gonna say movies. And I'm just going to list out some movies that I like. And we can do a bracket and I can say when Harry met Sally, we'll just give these as strings. I like the hangover. And I like the perks of being a wallflower. Now you can add whatever you like here. And my hangover here, by the way, I have the hangover here. My hangover on the line here is just because my notepad here is not wide enough. If I made it wider, it would actually just continue on. So uh, don't confuse this. If I hit enter, you'll see it goes to 148. So my wrapping does not mean I went into a new line. And lastly, we'll just say the exorcist. And we'll close the list off with a close bracket. So if I wanted to print the first movie in the list. If 
I wanted to print When Harry Met Sally. I come in here and I print movies and I wanted to say one. Do we think that would print the first item in the list? Go ahead and hit save, print. And you're going to see that it actually prints the hangover. So what am I doing here? I am calling an index. And our index actually starts with the number zero. So when we look at an index, we need to think of it as zero, one, two, three. Always count starting with zero, not one. Otherwise, you can return the wrong numbers and this can get very confusing. Let's make sure we add a note to this. Returns the second item in the list. Okay, we're looking at the second item with the index of one. If we printed, for example, movies and we gave it zero, then we would see that this will return the first item in the list. Okay, we'll save that, take a look real quick. You could see that the first item is when Harry met Sally and that's exactly what we're getting returned, which is what we want. Now let's look at a few tricks to splicing an index or indices. Uh, we can say something like print movies. And if we printed movies one to three, what would happen here? Well, what's gonna happen is it's going to return the first item given. So this is going to be index number one, which is item two. So first, I should say first index number given right until the last number given. It's not going to include the last number. We'll see even say, but not include the last number. So you know it's a lot. Let's just print it out. Take a look. So one to three will print the hangover starting at one and the perks of being a wallflower, which is two, it will not print three. Okay, so make sure you understand if you go one to three, you're only going to include two items, not three items. Now you can also do one to four, which would print all of those. If you wanted to print everything from the beginning of a number, so say we wanted to print movies one and we wanted to go all the way to the end, we could just do something like this. We could start from a certain point in index, print the hangover, perks of being a wallflower, the exorcist, and we're skipping when Harry met Sally because we're not starting at zero. Okay. We could also do in the opposite of that movies. And remember, if we go to one, it's not going to include one. It's only going to include the first item here. Everything before. So when Harry met Sally, everything up until this point is another way to think about it. Okay. So if we wanted to print two items, we'd actually have to add a second or put the number two here and that would include the hangover. That's what we wanted to do. Now, another thing that we can do is if we wanted to print the very last item, we could do a movies negative one. And you don't need to commit all this to memory right now, especially if you're not working with lists. But if you ever do work with lists, you need to pull specific items down from the list. This becomes very important. So important to know that indexes or indices exist. You start at zero and then you move forward. And then the way that you can spice these just depends on how you call these. Now this will return last item in list. We save that, take a look. You'll see it'll return the exorcist here. Now we can apply methods to lists just like printing length of movies. We'll print count the items in the list, right? In the list and we'll save that. Just take a quick look. I never close this, sorry. So you can see it tells you your mistakes and even I make mistakes. Come in here, try it again. You can see that we have four items within our list. All right, so, and that is true. We have four items in the list. We can also add to the list. So we can use something like movies.append will add to list. And if we wanted to add the movie Jaws, we could. And if we printed movies, you'll see that this 
appends to the end of the list. Let's go ahead and save that. And you'll see now that JAWS is here at the end. Now we could also insert a movie into the list. So if we did movies.insert and we wanted to put in a specific spot. So say we want to put it in index two, we could say two, and then we can give it a movie. Hustle, the movie I just watched recently and really liked. And we can come in here and print movies now. We save that. You can see that we can actually insert hustle here into position two on the index. So pretty neat. Now we can also remove movies. We did movies.pop, come in here, and that will remove the last item. So if we come in here, add a print statement really quick, save that, and then print this out, you'll see that JAWS is now gone. We can also specify specific spots we want to remove. So if we want to remove index zero, we could, and then this will remove the first item. Print movies, save, go ahead. And when Harry Met Sally is now gone from our list. We can also combine two lists. So if we come in here and let's say that my wife has favorite movies and she definitely does. And We'll just go with a couple of her favorite movies. She likes just go with it. And she also likes 50 first dates. Come in here and close that off. Well, we can combine movies. So let's say we wanted to know our favorite movies. What we can do, we can combine lists, I should say. Come in here and I could say, I want to add movies plus Amber movies and I can print our favorite movies. And then I have now combined lists. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Hopefully I did it right. And you can see now the Hangover, Hustle, Perks of Big Wallflower, Exorcist, just go with it, 50 First States. You could also just come in here, if you copied this, by the way, and just pasted this. You don't have to put it into a variable. You could totally do it like that. But I think storing in variables is a better practice. So I'm going to go ahead and just Control Z here. And one more thing. So we can also have what are called 2D lists. So two dimensional lists. So let's say, for example, we have grades and we have a list of grades. And we're going to say that inside of this list, we have Bob and his grade is an 82. And then we have Alice and she has a 90. Okay, and then we've got Jeff. Jeff's not doing so hot. Jeff's got a 73. Okay, and let's say we wanted to pull down Bob's grade. We could make a variable like just call it Bob's grade, and we could set that to grades and then do something like 0, 1, like this. And what are we doing here? Well, we're saying I want to pull from the first index, okay, index one or zero, right? First index, zero, one, two. So I'm pulling from zero. And within that, I want to pull the second item, which is this, zero, one. So we have a two dimensional index here. And if we went ahead and printed Bob's grade, you can see now if we save this. We get an 82. Well, that's correct. What if we screwed up Bob's grade and we wanted to fix it? Well, we could also do something like grades zero, one, just kind of like we called, and we could just set it equal to 83. Maybe it was an 83. Okay, we come in here and we print out grades. You should see that this has changed. So let's go ahead and print this. You can see now Bob has an 83. So we can modify our 2D lists as well. So that is it for lists. Remember, lists have brackets. Lists are data structures. We can change lists. As you saw, we were able to append, pop, insert, remove, 
okay, we can modify many different ways. We're going to move on here in a second to what are called tuples, and tuples cannot be changed. Even though they look very much like lists, they are different. So I'll go ahead and see you over in the next lesson when we cover tuples. Okay, let's talk about tuples very quickly, and then we're going to move on. So do a new line, say tuples. And these are like lists, but they do not change. We'll say do not change, and then they get parentheses, as opposed to getting brackets. Okay, so we might want to have something that doesn't change. And when something can't change, we say that they are not mutable, M-U-T-A-B-L-E. They're not mutable. So that means that they're immutable. And tuples are immutable, meaning we can't change them. So we think of lists, lists mutable, tuples not mutable or immutable. So if we have a tuple of grades, we can say something like grades are equal to A, B, C, this is the American grading system, D, and F. Come in here. If we did something like grades.pop, like we saw before, or grades.append, something like that, neither of these are not going to work. Or neither of these will work, I should say, proper English. What's going to happen is they're not mutable. We can't change them. Once we have this and we store it, it does not change. So if we want something that is like a list, but we don't want it to change, it's better to use a tuple. We can set something in stone, like our grade letterings, and then we can call those when we need to. We can just say something like print grades and give it a one and save it. And we should get a B back. Okay, and we get a B back. So that's it. Just know the difference between tuples and lists and that tuples do not change but they are very similar in how they can function. And there are pros and cons to each of those. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next lesson, which is going to be looping. Okay, so let's come in here, make a new line. And we're gonna call this looping. So we're gonna talk about two different types of loops. The first type of loop that we're going to talk about is what's called a for loop. And for loops are start to finish of an iterate. And here's what a loop looks like, and we'll take a look. So let's go ahead and get a list. We're going to say vegetables. And you can put whatever vegetables you want in here. I'm going to go with a cucumber. I'll do some spinach. And then we'll do some cabbage as well. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here and we're going to write a for loop. We're gonna say for x, and x could be whatever you want it to be. You could say for veggies, it could be whatever you wanna call it. In this instance, I'm just gonna call it x in vegetables, the so for x in this list. We're gonna go ahead and print out x. So what do you think this is going to do? All this is going to do is just loop through the iterates, start to finish of an iterate. So it's going to say cucumber, spinach, cabbage. Let's go ahead and give it a go, save it, print it, cucumber, spinach, cabbage. All we did was go through a list, iterate through it until we reached the end of the list, and then it stopped. So that is a for loop. Another good example of a loop, if you want to think about it, might be trying to ping an IP address, so like a 192.168.1.1. Or maybe you have 1.x. Maybe there's a whole slew of IPs that you want to ping. Maybe it's 1 through 254. Okay, If you wanted to ping all of those, you might want to do something like a 4x in IP, and where IP is just equal to like a sequence. Like say IP is like a sequence of one to 254. And don't worry about this. I'm just logically writing this out. So if you say IPs one to 254 for X and IP, 
and then you want to do something, you might want to like ping 192.168.1.x and then x will be one, then two, then three, then four. Okay, so you could write something like this for a ping sweeper. Again, it's a start to finish of an iterate, one through 254, we'll stop at 254 when the iterate is done. Now, another example of this, or another example of a loop, is what we call a while loop. Let me say while loops. These execute as long as true. I should probably capitalize true. So that way it makes sense that we're talking booleans. So let's think about this situation. What about we set i equal to one? So we've got a variable of i equal to one. While i is less than 10, we're going to go ahead and print out i. And then we're going to say i plus equals one. So what's going to happen? Well, while i is less than 10, so right now i is equal to 1, 1 is less than 10, that is true. We're going to go ahead and print i, increase the value of i by 1, so the next time it loops through, it's going to be 2, and it's going to continue on until this is no longer true. So if we save this, this should print out 1 through 9 because we're not looking for 10, just 1 through 9. So we're going to say that, hit enter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it looks like the loop actually did its job. So again, we have two types of loops. All we need to know about right now is we have a start to finish of an iterate. That's a for loop. Then a while loop executes as long as true. We may see these later on as we do our project work. So keep these in mind as we go on through the course. So from here, we're going to go ahead and move on to advanced strings. So I'll see you over in the next lesson. Okay, let's take a look at some advanced strings. So if we come in here, again, we do a new line. So go ahead and enter advanced strings. And let's create a variable of my name. I'm going to say my name is Heath. Now, let's say we wanted to print my name and we wanted to grab the first letter of my name. How do you think we might do that? Well, if you're saying index of zero, you are absolutely correct. And we can say in here, first letter. What about printing the last letter of my name? Well, if you say negative one, you have remembered your index lessons. Great job. That's going to be the last letter. We can save this and we can go ahead and print and if I made this a string, that would be very helpful. Go ahead and save this. You can see that we get the capital H and the lowercase h here, because my name starts with an H and ends with an H. So another thing to note about strings, much like tuples, they are also immutable. You cannot change a string. We cannot modify the string. We can join strings. We could split strings, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But once I have set this variable and this string, this string is here forever. I can always change the value of this variable, but you cannot change this string. So again, strings are immutable. Now let's go ahead and say we have a sentence. And we give that something like this is a sentence. If I can type today. And we print out sentence with something like this. What do we think that's going to look like? Let's save this, print it. You can see that we get this. What are we doing? Well, we're just grabbing this first word. However, we have the benefit of knowing what the first word is and how long it is. So we went 0, 1, 2, 3. Remember, we stopped at 4. So we grabbed the word this. Well, what if we were in a situation where we didn't know what the word was or how long the first word was? We could use something like a delimiter. So we could say print, and we could do sentence dot split. And if we do a dot split, we can just do it like this. 
And then this is a delimiter. And the delimiter says we're gonna take something and we're going to split based on that. Now the default delimiter in Python, if we just give it a split, is a space. So we save this, come in here. This is a sentence. Now look at it, it's in a list. We could pull the first item if we wanted to and know the first word instead of having to split it like this or pull it out like that. So we could do something like this as well. This is just a proof of concept that's a little bit fun. We go sentence split and we say that is equal to sentence dot split okay and then we also create another variable and we call that sentence join and we say that is equal to space we're giving it a delimiter to join on actually we're telling it what to add in between the different words that we're pulling out so we're adding a space here and we're going to say join sentence split like this and if we print out sentence join what do you think we're gonna actually have happen here let's save it guess what this is a sentence so all we did was deconstruct this sentence based on the delimiter it came out to this is a sentence and then we joined it back together with a space so every one of those got a space in between and that's it so that's just a nifty little way to show you that splitting and joining is possible and again this is still immutable even though we're messing around with the strings the strings are immutable so let's take a look at a few other things here i mentioned in the beginning of the first lesson when we were talking about strings initially that we might have different ways of using single quotes and double quotes and think about this like what if we had a situation of quote and we wanted to say something like he said give me all your money well with this situation what are we going to do what if we wanted to add quotes here and say give me all your money if we do that because that is a quote well it looks like it's kind of messed up we're not seeing it in green it kind of looks funny what we can do in this situation is we can use single quotes if we wanted to or we could flip this around by the way we could use single quotes on the outside and then double quotes on the inside if we wanted to use double quotes here and i could save this so let's print out quote just to show you and then we can save this another thing that we can do though is we can say something like quote and then we can just do he said and we can do character escaping so we can do give me all your money like this and now python knows that everything within these escaped characters is ignoring it's ignoring this double quote here and ignoring this double quote here so we're escaping that and then we can print it and hopefully we did this right go ahead and print you can see now it says he said give me all your money in double quotes while we also use double quotes on the outside so we can use character escaping if we want to just know that we'll have to use this backslash in front of each of the characters that we want to escape okay let's take a few more examples here so if we say something like a variable of too much space what happens in a situation where we have like you can just add as much space as you want in here it doesn't really matter we have a string with a lot of space in there well we can strip this out we can print too much space and then we can do a dot strip and the strip is going to take the delimiter of a space as default and that will also strip this out you can see there's just hello there nothing else so that's kind of nice a few more items what if we have the letter of a and we have the word of apple okay well what if we wanted to know something like this let's actually go up a little bit and let's say we wanted to know like print a and apple Okay, and what is this going to return? 
go ahead and if I could type, sorry. And this is going to return something. Let's go ahead and save that. That's going to return true. So we'll just say true. Now if we print A in Apple, you're going to see that this is going to return false. Save this. Why? Well, this here is a lowercase a, and that does not exist within Apple. So even though we're looking for a specific letter within a word, we have to match case sensitivity in order for that to return true. So if we wanted to know if the letter A was in the word Apple and we weren't concerned about case sensitivity, then what do we do in that situation? Well, this brings something up that we did a little bit early on, which is using lowercase. Remember the lowercase method, we can say print and then we can come in here and say letter dot lower. You could also do upper if you wanted to, but what we're doing is we're converting all of this to lowercase. So this is now going to be a lowercase a, and then we could say in word dot lower. And we can just say this is an improved way of doing this. So if we print that out, we save this, this should come back as true. So think about when you're trying to match a word or a string or anything. And if somebody came in and you were expecting like, I don't know, like think about school and we're thinking about uh, a word, maybe like Manhattan, I don't know. And somebody types in Manhattan like this. Okay, we still want to be able to accept that answer is true, even though they may have screwed up a little bit on the punctuation. Now, there could be instances where we want a capitalized letter and it has to be very specific. In that case, this kind of syntax works. But if we're looking to just accept an answer like Manhattan for Manhattan, then we might want to consider using lowercase or uppercase in that situation just to match those words or letters or whatever it might be. So one more thing, let's look at what is called string formatting. So if we do something like movie, we'll pick the hangover again. We say the hangover, you can pick whatever movie you want here. There's a few ways that we can print this out. Remember we concatenated early on and we said like print, we did something like my favorite movie is space plus, you know, movie, something like that, right? Well, we can actually write this in a certain way that is a little bit easier. So there's a few things that we can do. For example, we can do my favorite movie is add a couple brackets in here like that. And then we can add period at the end, just because we're going to close our sentence. We'll say dot format and we'll say movie and close that off. That's one way of doing it. Okay, if we save that, you can see my favorite movie is The Hangover. Okay, this is called using the string format method. Now what we can do, there's another type of method we can use is we could say print my favorite movie is percent %s and we say percent movie, just like this. Save that. This is using percent formatting. And look, the same thing happens. I just forgot my period in there. So no big deal. Lastly, if we print out an F in the front, this is called an F string or what's known as a string literal. We can do my favorite movie is, and then just do movie like this. Super easy. And we have moved off of using the format method and the percent method into this F string or string literal. And we come in here and save this, tab up, print, and you can see my favorite movie is The Hangover. So that worked out perfectly well. You can use any of these to format, but just know that the F strings are the latest and the greatest way of doing it in Python 3. So that is it for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and move on to dictionaries.
Okay, so we'll add new lines in here. And we'll say dictionaries. And we can think of these as key value pairs. And also think of these with the curly braces like this. So we've seen lists like that. And we've seen tuples. Now we can think of dictionaries with the curly braces. So let's go ahead and we're going to put some drinks and again, I'm going to use alcoholic beverages. You do not have to do that. You can use whatever drinks and prices in here that you want, but we're going to have a key value pair. So our key is going to be the drink. So first drink I'm going to pick up is a white Russian and the value is going to be seven. Let's say that a white Russian costs $7. If we do an old fashioned, we're going to say that this costs $10 and we'll do one more. We'll do a lemon drop and we'll just say that this costs $8. Okay. And we can make a note here to ourselves that drink is the key price is the value. Remember key value pairs, key value. All right. So we've got our drinks. We can print our drinks, save this. Go ahead, print. And you can see we print out our dictionary here. Now, let's give it a, another example. Let's say that we have employees. And this could be a good example. So we say we have employees. And I really like the show Bob's Burgers. So I'm going to use Bob's Burgers here as an example. Let's say we have different departments. We've got the finance department. And in the finance department, we actually have a list of people. What if we've got, we've got Bob, oops, we've got Linda and we've got Tina all in finance. We can also have another department. Let's have it. So again, that's the key and the value is going to be this list that we're putting in there. So Jean, Louise, and we'll throw Teddy in there as well. And that one, and let's do one more. We'll do HR. So HR, and we'll put in here, Jimmy Jr. And we'll also put in Mort. Again, you could put whatever you want in here. And if you need to pause, if you're trying to follow line for line, word for word, you need to pause and type this out, feel free to do that. I'm going to go ahead and print out our employees just to show this, make sure I type this all right, because this is a lot of syntax and we've got finance, it and HR. Looks like we did a great job. Awesome. So let's say I wanted to add a new key value pair. I could do that in a couple of different ways. We can do something like employees and we can just say something like we want to add a legal department. All right. And in the legal department, we're going to have just one person. We'll just have Mr. Frond. He's our legal team. Okay. And we'll just say adds new key value pair. Save that. Actually, let's print employees. So that way we can actually verify, save, print. And you can see legal adds Mr. Fron. So we are adding to the end of our dictionary, just like we added to the end of our list. Everything gets appended to the end unless we specify otherwise. Let's go ahead and come in here. Another way that we can do this is we can say something like employees dot update. And we can say something like give it a sales department. And in the sales department, we'll have Andy. We'll have Ollie. Close that off. And we're also going to have to close off our curly braces and we'll close off our parentheses. And if you have a decent notepad, it'll show you where your items are. So that way, you know, you're closing things off correctly. So we've got three different types of syntax going on there and it sometimes can be hard to read. So here we could say adds new key value pair as well. 
So just another way of doing it. We can print employees and we'll see that Andy and Ollie should be added provided we typed everything correct, which we did. So here's sales with Andy and Ollie. Okay, one more thing. Let's say that we wanted to update something in our dictionary. We're gonna go ahead and update a value. We're gonna go back to drinks for this one. Let's say that inflation has happened, which it has. And with inflation, the price of a white Russian has now gone up from $7 to $8. You can do something like that, print drinks, and you should see that hopefully this has been updated to $8, which it was seven before, now it's eight, perfect. We can also grab the value of that. So if we wanted to do something like print drinks.get, and then we do white Russian, we could totally do something like this and save, and hopefully it will return eight. And it does. So that is it for this lesson. We're gonna go ahead and move into a new file here in the next video. So let's go ahead and save this and close this and we'll prepare for the next video. So I'll catch you over in the next lesson. Okay, so I wanted to talk about importing. And we're gonna talk about importing modules. So I wanted to make a new file for this. Let's just call this mousepad importing.py or whatever you wanna call it. And I'm gonna do the ampersand here. And again, if you're using Windows or Mac, just make sure you create a new file for this. I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to add my shebang like before. I'm gonna declare bin Python three and save this. And now we're going to go ahead and talk about importing. So importing, let's type this importing. And when we say importing is important. Now modules exist within Python that are built in, but not available to us without importing them. So like you saw us being able to do math, but we could import a more robust module of math and then use that to do more advanced calculations outside of adding, subtracting, exponents, etc. cetera. Um, in this instance, we're going to talk about a couple of different imports that we can do and that you're gonna see again as we get into some of our hands-on stuff and we build out some projects. For example, we might want to import something called sys. Now let's say if we tried to print out sys.version and we'll just save this and then we're going to python3 importing.py and you're going to see that I get an error back that says sys is not defined. Name sys not defined. Okay. Well, sys is something that we're going to use quite often in Python. You're going to see it imported quite a bit and it does a lot of different unique items like it does something called argv, for example, which we'll use as an example later on. But if we want to specify a, an amount of arguments, say we're trying to run uh, Python 3, we're going to do a port scanner later. So we'll just say port scanner.py and we need to supply an IP address here, right? And this is argument zero. This is argument one. So if we supply no argument one, then we're going to throw an error. It's gonna be an if else statement, and that's going to use something called argv. Now we'll get into that later, but that's very important. And it's a part of sys. Uh, another part of sys is doing something like the version type of Python that we're using. Or another thing is the sys.exit, which you'll see later on as well, which is going to allow us to gracefully exit when we encounter an error, we tell the script to exit or whatever we're doing. So we might need to import something like sys or another one is OS, which is very common to be imported as well. So let's talk about importing. In order to import, we can say something like import sys, just like this. And we can just say this is for system functions and parameters. Save that. 
And let's go ahead and just print this now and see what happens. And you can see now that sys has been imported, even though it wasn't built in automatically, we can import it. And you can see now it tells us, hey, we are running on version 3.10.5 of Python. And it was downloaded on June 8th, 2022, or built on June 8th of 2022. So from here, let's go ahead and import something else. Let's go ahead and import date time and we can import from something so I know this is going to be confusing but we can import specifics from a module so we're just importing the date time feature from date time even though they're named the same just know that we can import specifics we don't have to import the whole thing even though we totally could just import the whole thing as well so here for example we can say print date time dot now like this and you know what this is going to do it's going to tell you what the date and the time is and i apologize this is backwards this is it's from date time import date time so again your syntax will tell you where it's wrong and it is perfectly normal to make mistakes i leave these in the video so that you see that i am human too and it's completely normal to make mistakes like this so go ahead and do your script now and you'll see that it gives the date and the time so right now it is July 6th and it is two o'clock in the morning. I am a night owl. Now, one other thing that we can do is we can come in here and we can from daytime import daytime. And we can also give this an alias. We can say as DT. What if we don't want to write date time out? We just want to do DT just like we didn't want to write new line out. We did NL. Same kind of concept. So we can just say import with alias. And instead of saying date time dot now, we could just say DT dot now. Save that. Go ahead and print it. You can see it still works. So absolutely the same thing. We're just giving an alias, making it a little bit easier to run. Okay, so that is it for this video. Let's go ahead and close this out and then I'm going to meet you in the next video when we're going to talk about sockets before we get into building out a port scanner. So I'll catch you over in the next video. Okay, so let's make a new file and we're going to call this s.py. And again, create this however you want to. If you're using Linux, you can follow along like this or just create a new file in Linux or Windows. Again, we're going to shebang this up here. I'm going to give this a bin Python 3. Now, this isn't incredibly necessary if you're running on Windows or Mac, but this is just best practice for me. This is the location of my Python. Even though I'm not actually calling it, I am calling it with Python 3. So this isn't incredibly relevant as long as you're using Python 3. Now, we are going to deal with sockets. So sockets. Now sockets are what can be used to connect two nodes together. So we're going to use this to connect to ports and IP addresses. If you're unfamiliar with computer networking, that's okay. But what we're looking for is a port and we're going to look for that port on an IP address. And on that IP address that that port is open, we're going to make a connection to this. We're going to build a port scanner in the next video or in the, later on in the lesson and you'll see this in action right now i just want you to notate understand what we're doing and then i'm going to demonstrate an example that you do not have to follow along with and you might not be able to follow along with so that's okay but just know that sockets are used to make a connection between ports and ip addresses and you'll see that here very shortly so you do not name this, by the way, socket.py. If for some reason you came in here and you named this socket.py, this will break Python because we are going to import socket. So make sure that you come in here and you rename this if you named it socket.py. It's very easy to do that, but that will break the socket.py, which is what we're importing here. So with this, we're going to set a couple of variables. We're going to say host is equal to 127.0.0.1. And this is our loopback address or our home address. If you're not familiar with computer networking, I do recommend that you go take a class on computer networking because it will become very important 
as you get into Python development, especially if you ever work with nodes of any sort. So other thing is ports. So we have ports on our machine that we can connect to. We're going to be using TCP. Uh, if you do not know what TCP is or what the ports are, that's okay. You can still follow along, but know that there are 65,535 available ports. Some ports are very common in what they use, like port 80, for example, is a web server over HTTP. You have 443, which is HTTPS. 21 is FTP. There's a lot of common ports and protocols that are out there. We're going to pick a non-standard port, non-common. We're just going to say 7777. So what I'm going to tell this to do is I want to tell this to reach out to this host, which is just going to be us for this example, and this port. So I want to make a connection on this port. Now, I'm going to give a variable of S, and this is going to be a very long statement. So if you say socket dot socket, I'm going to type this out and then I'm going to explain everything. Okay. So socket dot AF inet. Then we're going to say socket dot sock stream. And then just for your notes, AF inet is IPv4. Sock stream is a port. So we're giving it this S because we are not wanting to type this whole long thing out all the time. We're just shortening this. What we're going to do is we're going out to make a connection to this AFI net, which is IPv4 IP address, which is what this is. And we're going to also make a connection on a port, which is our sock stream. We're going to give it this port. So we're going to say that by doing S dot connect. And we're going to come in here and this is going to be a tuple. So we're actually going to use double parentheses here, host port. Okay. And we could come in here by the way, and we could just put in one, two, seven, zero, zero, one, instead of using a variable, but I like to use variables because it's best practice, but you could hard code this in if you wanted to, but here I just like using the variables it's easier to change, especially if you're coming in here and you're writing in a bunch of host port calls to the variable. It's easy just to have it in one place as opposed to hard coding this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. This is where I do not expect you to follow along because you might not have the architecture behind it. Now, as I stated in the beginning of this video, I am an ethical hacker by trade, which means that this version of Kali that I've been running on or this version of Linux that I've been running on is actually Kali Linux. And in Kali Linux, we have a bunch of tools available to us for pen testing and ethical hacking. One of those tools is a tool called Netcat. Now Netcat is NC and basically what it does is allows us to connect to open ports or establish a listener on an open port. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to open up a new tab here and make this bigger. And then I'm going to run this here. Just understand if you've never used Netcat before, that's fine. I'm just opening up a listener on a port. That's all. Just worry about the L and the P for now. Listen on port 7777. Anybody makes a connection on that port? We're listening. So we are going to connect to ourselves because we wrote the script out to 127001, which is us. And all we're going to do is Python 3 s.py and enter. Nothing's going to happen. We don't have any print statements, anything crazy. But you can see that a connection was made from 127001 to 127001. And it made a connection on this port. And we connected on the other side on this other port here, which don't worry about that too much. If you're not familiar with networking, that's absolutely OK. But there has to be two ports being connected, um, one on one side, one on the other. So here, we made that connection. We didn't tell this to do anything else. We just said, hey, go out, listen for this connection. We made a connection. We established it. We did our job. We used our socket and we are good to go here. We closed the connection because there was nothing, no instructions given or anything else. And that's all we needed. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, in the next video, build out what I call a terrible port scanner. And we'll talk about why it's terrible, but we're going to tie everything we've learned so far together 
and build something out that is actually usable with Python. So been throwing all these lessons and terms and everything out to you. Now we're going to apply that. And you're going to see how we can use that all together. And I'm very excited. So I'll catch you over in the next lesson when we start building out a port scanner. It is time to create our first project. And this project is going to be building out a terrible port scanner. And so let's go ahead and create a new file. I'm going to call this scanner.py. Give it the ampersand here if you're on Linux. And then we're just going to call this then Python 3, save it, get the pretty colors going. And what we are going to do is we are going to create a scanner that is going to be something like this. We're going to type in Python 3 scanner.py and then we're going to say IP address. We want to provide an IP address and then it's going to go out and do port scanning on that IP address. So hopefully we can build that out. For now, let's go ahead and import a couple of things. I should say a few things. We're going to import sys, talked about sys. We're going to import socket, talked about socket. And from date time, we're going to go ahead and import date time. So none of this should be new to you. So first thing that we're going to need to do is define our target. So we need to set up an if statement. I'm just going to say define our target. And what I want to say is if the length of sys argv, and I'll explain this in a second, is equal to two, then we're going to set a target variable. Target is going to be equal to socket dot get host by name. And we're going to say sys dot argv one. And all this is going to do is translate host name to IPv4. All right. Let me make the else statements. I'm going to come back. I'm going to explain everything. OK, so if we do else, we're going to print out invalid amount of arguments. And also print out syntax Python three scanner dot pi IP address. Something like that. OK, go ahead and close that off. OK. So we are taking a method of length and we're saying sys.argv. We spoke a little bit about argv in the importing section. Argv is going to be the amount of arguments that we are giving. So when we come in here and we type in Python three, okay, our first argument, argument zero in theory, is going to be scanner.py. The second argument or second index, index of one, is going to be the IP address that we give. So 192.168.1.1 or whatever it might be. So we need to have two arguments. If we have a third argument, it's going to break. If we don't have a second argument, it's going to break. If we just type in scanner.py, it'll break. If we type in an IP address, like 1.1, .1, and then we type in something here, it's going to break because there's too many arguments. So if it doesn't meet this specific length, then what we're going to do is print out invalid amount of arguments. Here's the syntax. Give somebody some, some help here. If it does meet the length, then what we're going to do is we're going to set our target equal to socket dot get host by name. And all this is saying is we're going to get host by name of sys argv one. That's our IP address. Now this is going to translate a host name to an IPv4. So in case, for example, if you did Python three scanner dot pi and you had a host name, like I have a host in my house called Punisher. Like if I gave it Punisher and my DNS knew internally that that translated to a specific IP address in my network, that's fine. This will translate. 
Okay, easy enough. But we could also just give it an IP address. So that's what we're looking for here. I highly recommend for this example using an IP address. In previous lessons when I've taught this before, somebody has tried typing in a host name and it doesn't always go as planned, though we will talk about adding error exceptions for that here in a little bit. So right now, all we need to know is we're trying to set this up with these arguments. Now, this is not the best logic. This is something that will work for our needs because we are building this out. But if we're building this out for somebody else, this logic's not great. And this is why I call this a crappy port scanner is because it's not the best. We're only doing it for proof of concept and to learn what we've learned so far. But think about this in another way. Think about if we're running two arguments, well, I could give this an argument. What if I, what if I come in here and I say Python three scanner.py and I give it the second argument, but I give it like 192.1 or something like that. Well, that's not a host name. It's not going to translate to anything. That's also not really an IP address. So we should really add some other statements in here to say, Hey, it needs to be a valid IP address. It needs to be like, have four octets like we expect. And if we really wanted to get critical about this, we can make sure that it is a valid IP address because IP addresses can start with like 256 dot whatever. So we could say it must be between like, you know, each octet must be between one and 254 and get really refined with that and say, hey, that's not a valid IP address. Thus, we're not going to scan this. But we don't have to worry about that right now. I'm just saying the logic behind it, we need to start thinking about, well, how can a user break this? We know how to run it, but if we gave this to somebody else, how would they run it and how could they break it or how could they typo something? So these are things to think about as we go. So for now, we've added this in. We've got this in here. We could test this if we just save it. And we come in here and we just say Python 3 scanner.py. We don't give it any arguments. You'll see that it says invalid amount of arguments. Python 3 scanner.py is the syntax. Perfect. Don't give it an argument right now because it's going to break if you don't have DNS translating properly. So from here, let's go ahead and add a pretty banner. So I'll just add a pretty banner. And all I'm going to do is do a print command. And I'm going to just do a bunch of dashes. This is not really going to be that pretty of a banner, but it's still going to be a banner. And so when this kicks off, if, if we've got a valid IP that we're going to be scanning, we're just going to do scanning target and then we'll just do a space and you could just do a concatenation here of plus target. You could do F string if you want completely up to you on how you want to do this. So we just do scanning target plus target. This will say what the IP address is. We can do like scanning target of that something along those lines. And then we could say print time started. And then we can give this something like a string. So we want to give plus a string of date time dot now. Remember, we can't concatenate numbers and strings. So we're going to go ahead and do this. And then we'll just print out this one more time. OK, I'm going to save this. Let's go ahead and try running this with like, I don't know, 192.168.1.1. OK, so this is what we get. We can see that we have scanning target. OK, scanning target 192.168.1.1. Here's the time that it started. Perfect. We've got a pretty banner set up. So now let's actually start making it do something. So we're going to use what is called the try command. We're going to try something. And if it works, perfect. If it doesn't, we're going to have exceptions for that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say try for we're going to do a for loop port in range. Remember, we talked about a range earlier. We talked about, well, what about a four IP in range of one through 254? We're doing the same concept here. Now we're just giving it a range. Now there are 65,535 potential ports. I'm not going to force you to scan all those. If you want to, you can come in here and say 65,535. This is not threaded. We are not doing any sort of 
speed runs here. This is could potentially be a slow port scanner. So it is best, in my opinion, to do like a port scan between 50 and 85. And the reason I do this is because we're going to scan or attempt to scan our home router. And usually DNS is open on that. And usually port 80 is open on that. So I'm trying to look and see if we can find a couple ports that might be open. So for port in this range, what we're going to do is we're going to set our S equal to that lovely socket dot socket socket dot AF inet and socket dot sock underscore stream just like that. And then we're also going to come in here and we're going to do a socket dot set default timeout to one. So if it responds back or doesn't respond back within a second, we're just going to move on. We don't want to stick to scanning a port, waiting, waiting, waiting for it not to respond back to us. And then the script takes long and longer and longer. So we just want to make sure that we set our default timeout to one there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set a variable of result. And result is going to equal to s.connect underscore ex. And I'll explain all this in a second. Target and port. All right. So what this is doing here, actually, let me type out the rest and then we'll go back. Um, we're going to say if result is equal to zero, we're going to print out port. We can do is open. So now we can come in here and we can do a format port if we want to. You could use an F string here if you want to. So we can just use an F string. So I'm just showing you examples, but you can say port and just do an F in front of this. Okay. Port whatever is open. And then we're going to close the connection. All right, well, let's read through this. Make sure we understand what's going on. So we're going to do a for loop for port in the range of 50 to 85. So we're going to start with 50, then 51, then 52. Go through that process. We are setting a variable of s equal to this because we're going to gather the IPv4 address and we're going to gather the port that we're trying to connect to. Now, our IPv4 address, here's our tuple right here. We are saying, I want to connect on target and port. Target is going to be supplied by us. We're going to use argv1. So we're going to supply the IP address, and the port is going to be this range here. So for port in range, we're declaring port here. Now, this s.connect underscore ex, this is an error indicator. So if a port is open, the error result returns zero. If a port is closed, it returns a one. So if the result is a zero, we're going to say, hey, this port was open. If it's not, it's going to close out and we're going to close this. Then we're going to go back to the loop and come through and try it again. So we're going to close out our socket connection on that port. Come back, try 51, 52, et cetera, et cetera. Now, before we run this, there are some exceptions that we need to consider. So the first one, we're going to try this, but we need exceptions. So except, what if we have a keyboard interrupt? So we'll say keyboard interrupt. And that just means what if we hit control C while this is running? We can stop this on our own. So we're providing an exception of a keyboard interrupt, and we're going to say exiting program on a new line. And then we're going to sysexit. Remember, I talked about sysexit, and we're going to allow us to exit gracefully. We can also do an exception of a socket.gai error. Now this is what happens when the host name does not resolve. So what if we say host name could not be resolved? So if we typed in a bunch of mumble jumbo up here, we say like Python three scanner dot pi. And we just typed in something and that doesn't resolve to an IP address. Well, guess what? This is going to throw an error now. 
and we can exit. We got to cover all of our bases. Lastly, what if we have a socket dot error? So we have an error when we're doing this and we print out, hey, we could not connect to the server. Just It's just not online. What if we try to connect to an IP address and it doesn't talk back to us? Could not connect to the server. So something to think about there. Again, we'll sys.exit. So let's go ahead and save this. Now, you're going to need to run this against something. So I'm going to show you an example of mine. OK, so in order to run this, we need an IP address. Now, if I type in IF config, I'm actually on a virtual machine right now. So 192.168.138.140 is not my true IP address. I'm actually going to bring up my Windows machine that I'm on. And you can see here that I have a default gateway of 192.168.4.1. So make sure you know your gateway or what your router's IP address or that you have a machine that you can scan that you know might have a port of 53 or 80 open, or you need to modify your script to make sure that you can scan for something. But I'm going to go ahead and scan my 4.1 because it should have some stuff open. So if I do a Python 3 scanner.py, and I'm going to come in here and just do a 4.1, and I hit Enter, this could take some time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this sit here. Actually, it's already it's zooming through. Uh, you can see it found port 53 pretty quick. Um, and then this might take time to find port 80 if port 80 is open. But basically what it's going to go through is go through port 50, 51, 52, 53, all the way through the process and has that one second timeout as it goes through and checks each and every one of these ports. So it should take maybe up to a minute for this to work. So I'm going to go ahead and pause right here. looks like we're almost done actually. Port 80 came back as open too. No need to pause. It finished while I was yapping. So you can see it came back and said port 53 is open. Port 80 is open. So our script worked. It took forever to scan these ports, but it is working. So we were able to build out. Let's go back and look at this. This is awesome. We were able to build out a port scanner that came in here. And it, within two hours, you now have the knowledge to build out a basic port scanner. If you didn't think you would be able to do that. Well, here you are. Look at you. You're awesome. OK, so we were able to give it an argument. We set our if conditional statement. Make sure the length of the argument was two. Valid. Otherwise, we have an else here. We made a little pretty banner. We imported some stuff. Got that all working. We did a try statement, which really was just a for loop in here. And we had some logic based on conditions that would happen within this for loop. We had a for loop and an if statement together. We used a f string to print this out. Pretty cool. Came through. We had some exceptions as well. For example, like the keyboard interrupt, just as to show you if I come and run this again, if I wanted to stop this scan in the middle of it, I could just hit control C and it'll say, hey, exiting program. And that's exactly what we told it to do. So you can say in here, it says exiting program. So that's the keyboard interrupt. Same thing. We had exceptions for not being able to connect or we had the host name could not resolve. We would also have those sorts of things as well. So you could test out those errors, see if they work for you. But other than that, we built a scanner. So this is project number one. We're going to go ahead and move on to learning a little bit more Python, and then we'll go ahead and get into some more project work. So I'll see you over in the next video. Now we're going to take a look at accepting user input in our program and then how we can manipulate data with that input. So let's go ahead and make a new file. I'm going to just say mousepad and we'll call this input.py. And I'm going to bring this over. We'll give this the shebang bin Python 3 here. Save it, get the pretty colors. And in order to take input in Python, all we actually need to do is just use input, something like this. So we could say, like, enter your name for input like this and put a space. And we'll need to put this into a variable. So if we come into the front of this and we just say name is equal to, we could do something like that. And then we can just print out like hello and give a space. 
do name and then we'll add an exclamation at the end or a period at the end doesn't really matter and then we can just come in here and save that and if we run this close this out I forgot to add an ampersand so we'll do that real quick and if we run this now we just say python3 and we say input dot pi I'll say enter your name I'll just say Heath and you can see it says hello Heath we can add upon this we can say like what's your favorite drink so if we just make a variable and we call it drink and we do input and say what's your favorite drink and do a question mark something like that we can come in here and then just add upon this if we want we can just say have a space plus drink plus period all right and it should say welcome Heath have a and then whatever drink we put in here so if we save this come back and run it okay I'm gonna put Heath as my name and then white Russian is my favorite drink and it says hello Heath have a white Russian so we can easily accept input like this so let's think about if we wanted to build out a calculator I'm gonna go ahead and delete this what if we wanted to take input and make a mini calculator? We could definitely do that. So what if we had two numbers and we've been taking X and Y. So if we said X is equal to input and we'll just say, give me a number and then we'll do something like that. And then we can also do Y and also make that input give me yet another number you put whatever you want here by the way and if we do something like print x plus y and we do that let's save it and let's see what happens here so I'm going to print this out we'll give a number we'll do three and then we'll do two and it gave us 32 why is it doing that well what it's doing is it is taking these and giving this to us as a string so we need to either do an integer here and put this in an int or we need to take this as a float so if we think about this from the past if we want to only take integers we can but if somebody were to put in like 8.7 or some number here and they gave that to us well we would only take the 8 and we would leave off the 0.7 so I think if we're building out a calculator, it's better to use floats. So we can just come in here and say float and we'll put this all in parentheses and then we'll do the same thing right here. So now when we come in here and we save this and run this again, what should happen is this should work properly. So if we did like three and then 3.2, you'll see that we get 6.2, which is proper. That's awesome. Well, what if we wanted to build this out further? We could make this into a situational thing. What if we not only wanted to do an addition, but what if we wanted to allow the user to say, I want to add or subtract or divide or multiply or maybe use an exponent? We could do that. So what if we added another variable and we just called this O for operator and we just took that input and we just said, something along the lines of input give me an operator right and maybe we put this in the middle here so that way we're not just getting two numbers maybe we want to take that and we want to say something like this so that way you'll say give me a number give me an operator and then give me another number and we'll print that out so now let's think about how we want this to flow if we want this to work with a addition like we already have we might want to come in here and just say something like if o for our operator is equal to a plus sign well then we'll come in and just print out x plus y and remember the indentation is important here else if or l if o is equal to a minus guess what we're going to print x minus y and we can continue on here else if o is equal to division 
we'll divide. And then we'll multiply as well. So x divided by y. Else if o is equal to multiply here. We'll go ahead and multiply that. And let's throw in an exponent for good measure. So let's do l if o is equal to an exponent. So that's two asterisks there. And then we'll just print out x times y. So we've got a mini little calculator here. And we need to end this with an else statement. So what if we take input that doesn't belong here? If it doesn't match one of these operators, then we can just print something like unknown operator. All right, and just put a period there, save that. And this should work. So let's go ahead and give this a try. What if we come in here and we just say, give me a number, we'll do three. And let's say we want to multiply and we'll do by three. And we get a nine. We can do it again. We can try something like we'll do a four and this time we'll do an exponent and we'll do four. So four to the fourth power is 256. So we have just quite easily built out a little calculator that we take input from a user and then utilize that to uh, calculate that expression given what is given to us by the user. Now let's think of something else here just as an aside. What if something is written differently? Like when I think of math with Python, yes, we think of two asterisks as an exponent. But what if we had a situation where we wanted to maybe use the up arrow or the caret symbol, which is how I've commonly seen it used online for math and exponents? Well, we could do something like or O is equal to the up arrow like that. And what if we save that and ran this now? And if we gave a four to the up arrow of four, guess what? We still get 256. So we can use our statement like that here, our and, or, or other operators that we have learned along the way. So start thinking about it like that. As we start to piece these things together, we're starting to build out little projects and we can use some of the logic that we have already learned throughout this course. So that's it for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Okay, now we're going to talk about reading and writing files using Python. So let's go ahead and make a new file. I'm just going to mouse pad and we're going to call this file months.txt. And in here, let's go ahead and just type out the months. So we'll do January, February, March, April, if I could type, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. If you need to take a break and catch up, go ahead and do that. Save this, and once you have it saved, go ahead and close the file out. So let's go ahead and create a new Python file. So we'll call this mousepad, and I think we'll just call this readwrite.py. I'll do the ampersand here. And for this, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at how we can read and write files. So the way that we do that is with the open command. So we'll say something like open and with open and actually let's add the shebang up here really quick in Python three, save it. And with the open command, we can say something like open months dot txt and I need to add this here so if we open months.txt what we need to do with this or what we typically do with this is we store this within a variable so we might just call this months equals open months.txt and if we want to read that file we can come in here and just print out months and you'll see what this does here in a second now Best practice says to also close this out anytime we open this. So I'm going to go ahead and just add some lines in here because we're going to add some more stuff to this. But we can just do months.close. And we'll save this. 
let's go ahead and run and see what happens here. So if we do Python three read write dot pi, you'll see we get this information back. Let me move this so it's readable. And what this tells us is, hey, this is the name of the file. We're in a certain mode, and this mode currently is read mode. And we get the default encoding here of UTF-8. So we're getting information back. We're not actually reading the file that we wrote. So um, some of the information that we can get, by the way, we can come in here and we can say to ourselves, well, is this file readable? So we have mode equals R, and this is one way to check it. There's a couple ways that we can check it as well. We can print out months.mode, and that will tell us what mode we're in. We can also print out months.readable, and that should give us a Boolean statement whether that is true or false. So if we come in here and we save this, and we do this again, You'll see that we get months. We print that out. We get the whole shebang here and we get the uh, mode is equal to R, which is readable. You can see if we print out the mode, we can also see it's readable. Or if we do months readable, we can see that it is readable. So we have the ability here to actually print this out and read this file. So how do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and delete these two lines. And we can just come in here and do months.read. If we do that, what happens here? Let's save it, print this out. And you can see that it reads through every single iteration, January all the way through December. Perfect. So we just read a file and we closed out working as intended. If we wanted to read this line by line, we could. We can do months.read line like this. And if we save that and print, we will read literally one line. If we wanted to read a second line, we could copy this and we could paste this and save it and come in here and guess what? We'll get January and February this time. So if we want to read this, we have to read line by line. Now, if we wanted to read all the lines at once, we could do that in a different way. We could do that with read lines and this will print out an empty array or a list here actually. And what you'll see is we get January, new line, February, new line, March, et cetera. So we put this into a list. And now if we try to actually run this again, let's actually tab over. If we tried to run this twice, look what happens. So I'm going to print this and save this. So we have the first list here, and then we have a second list here. The second list is empty. Well, that's because we've actually already read this. So we read through it here first, and then it's empty the next time we try to read it. So if we wanted to read it again, what we need to do is actually use what is called the seek method. We can come in here and say months.seek, do zero like that to go back to the very first line and print out again. And now you can see we actually printed this out twice. So that works out well. We also have the ability to put this into a for loop to read through every iteration of the line. So if we wanted to do something like for month in months, we could just print out month. All right, and that should iterate through everything in here. So save that, print this. And you can see that it indeed does print through everything. We can also add the dot strip at the end of this. Save that. Print. And you can see that we strip out any of the new lines that are in there. So you saw we got some spacing in here. It's a little funky. So if we came through and we just added the dot strip, that makes our for loop a little bit better. So again, remember what we're defining here is whatever we want. We can call this for X in months, make this an X and it's the same thing. But logically, it's just easy to call this month in months, and then we can just print those out. So we can iterate through this. So, so far, up until this point, all we've done is been able to read a file. What if we want to write to a file or append to a file? Well, we can do that as well. So if we wanted to, for instance, open a file, let's open a new file. Let's do something we haven't created yet. Let's do days of the week. 
So let's do open days. And if we try to do this, let's change months to days. And we're going to change days to close. And we're just going to leave this open right here. So we have our best practice. Now, if we try to run this with an open days.txt, uh, we're not going to be able to do that because currently we're just in read mode. So we want to be able to turn over and put ourselves into write mode. In order to do that, we can just do a W. And if we wanted to check that out, we could just do print days.mode like we saw before. Make sure we are actually operating in write mode. So if we save this, you'll see that we are in write mode. So we're good to go. You could also just, again, delete this, save, and print out days. Apologies. You print out days, save that. You'll be able to see that we are also in write mode. So both of these work. Now let's write to a file. So we've got days. Let's go ahead and write to that. So we can do something like days, oops, days dot write. And let's say we wanted to put Monday into days. Save that, close it. And if we go ahead and execute that, nothing happens. But if we go ahead and cat out days.txt, you'll see that Monday has been put into days.txt. Perfect. So now what if we wanted to continue on with this? Let's put Tuesday in there. And we're going to need a new line. So let's go ahead and do a new line with that. And we'll do Tuesday. And hopefully when we write this out, we'll see Monday and Tuesday. So let's save that print this. Sorry, let's run the script and then print this. And you'll see we have the new line in there and we have Tuesday, but we actually overwrote it. We don't we don't have Monday anymore. So what's happening here is we're actually writing to a file, which is overwriting the file. We're not appending to the file. So if we wanted to append to the file, what we need to do is change this W to an A. And we can come in here and we can write in Wednesday if we wanted to save this and now let's run this and run that and now you can see we have tuesday and wednesday so understand the difference between r being read w being write which overwrites and a being append which allows us to append a file instead of overwriting a file so that is it for this lesson i'll go ahead and see you over in the next one All right, let's talk about classes and objects. So Python is what is known as an object oriented programming language. So pretty much everything in Python is an object and we can use what is called a class to be what is like an object constructor. And we can use that to help create objects. And this is a little bit easier to explain once we actually demonstrate this. So we're going to create a couple of files in this lesson. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a mouse pad and I am going to create a file called employees.py. And in this, we're going to go ahead and declare a class. I'm going to save this here. So let's do class of employees, save it. And we're going to go ahead and hit enter and just tab over. And we're going to do this define and two underscores, I N I T or in it, two underscores again. And we're going to put some parameters inside of this function. And we'll talk about what the init function is here in a second. So let's go ahead and let's think about having employees. So the first parameter we're going to define is called self. And then for our employees, we might want to know the employee's name. We might want to know what department they work in. We might want to know their role in that department, their salary, and maybe the years that they've been employed. So we'll do years underscore employed. And just like a function, we'll add the colon here at the end. And we're going to go ahead and tab. And then we're going to define all of this. So let's go ahead and say self dot name is equal to name. So we're creating methods here, which you'll see us use in just a bit. We're going to do self dot department equals department. 
and you should get the gist at this point. Self.role is equal to role. Self.salary is equal to salary. Self.years employed is equal to years employed. Okay, so let's save that. So all classes have a function called the init function. And this is always executed when the class is being initiated. So we're going to use this init function to assign values to object properties. So what we're doing here is we're creating these parameters within this function. And we're also building out methods that we can use once we import this class. So let's go ahead and close this out. And we're going to open up another mouse pad. And we'll just call this something like our employees.py. You can call it whatever you want. And I'm going to go ahead and do my shebang at the top. We'll do bin Python 3. Save that. And from here, I want to actually import the class that we just built. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import this. And we're going to say from employees import employees. All right. And we can make a couple of employees here. So let's set a variable of E1 for employee one, and we'll just do employees. And I'm going to stick with the Bob's Burgers theme from earlier. We'll just say we've got Bob. Remember, we were declaring Bob's name, his department. We'll say he works in sales. We'll say that his role within that department is the director of sales. And we'll say his salary is $100,000 a year and that he has been employed for 20 years. And we'll do another employee. And we'll say that this employee is Linda. She is an executive. She is the chief information officer or the CIO. She makes $150,000 a year and she has been with the organization for 10 years. So we can do some stuff with this. We can go and say like print e1.name. Let's save this, make sure everything works. Come in here. Actually, let me close and reopen this because I forgot my ampersand on this. And we'll come back and now we'll go ahead and do Python 3 R employees. And you'll see that print e1.name is pulling down Bob. So we're using the name method that we created with our class. So we define that within that class. So now we have the ability to pull down information based on the class that we built. So we can also do something like print e2.role and we should get that role printed out for us. So if we see e2role, we're getting that uh, she is a CIO, so that is accurate statement here. So let's see if we can open both of these. Let's open also employees.py, and we have both of these here now, so it's a little bit easier to see. We've got our function, our init function here, and we have all of our methods that we've defined. Now we can build upon this within this class. So let's say if we wanted to make another function, if we wanted to say something like define eligible for retirement and we just said self in here as the parameter what if we said something like if self dot years employed is greater than or equal to 20 then we return true because if the person has worked with us for 20 years then they are eligible for retirement otherwise if they haven't then they haven't earn their retirement yet. So we can look at an employee and see how long they've worked with us. And we can save this here. Uh, and then we can come in here. We can do something like print. And we'll say E1. And we'll ask if they are eligible for retirement. OK. Save this, print this out. And you'll see that. Bob is indeed eligible for retirement because he has been with the company at least 20 years, which is what we put here within the class. 
So just know what we're doing is we're building out our own class and we're able to define these functions and these parameters and these help us with creating our objects that we're using over here. So we've got our classes and then we've got our objects. So this can get really robust very quick and we'll build out a project to look at that here in the next lesson and that way we can tie this all together. But this is a very important part of programming. And this is very much a one-on-one class. So we're just skimming the surface on what this is. But this is actually incredibly useful when we start building out classes like this to help with other things that we're writing and pulling information from. So that's it for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. We have reached the final project in this course. And this is going to tie everything together that we have learned thus far. So I am a bit of a sneaker head, which means I really like shoes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a budget app using classes and objects. And we're going to see what shoes we can afford based on how much money we have. So we're going to go ahead and start with the class and we're going to just make a new file. We'll do mouse pad and we'll call this shoes. I can type shoes.py. Open that up. And we'll also open up a new window as well, or just a new tab here. And we'll write in both of these. So uh, for this one, we're going to go ahead and just define a class of shoes. And I'm going to go ahead and just save that so I see the colors. And here we're going to define our init statement. And we're going to just say self. And then we're going to have a name, our name of our shoe and the price of our shoes. And within this, we're just going to define self.name equals name. This should all look familiar so far. And self.price is equal to price. What we're going to do with the price because we'll run into an instance where this is going to be taken potentially as a string we're going to go ahead and just give this a float we want to make sure that we are assuming this is going to be a float of a price here let's go ahead and define a few more things so i want to define a budget check and i want to make sure that we have the budget here so what we're going to do in this instance is we're just going to say self and then we'll also add in budget here and we'll come in here and we'll do a check first we want to make sure that we are given an integer or a float here when we are asked for the budget so we can say something like if not is instance and what this means is we're saying if this type is not what we're specifying here then we're going to go ahead and reject this and close out of the application. So the is instance looks for a type and returns a true value. But if we say is not true, then that's false. Remember our truth tables and thus becomes invalid and closes the app. So what's going to happen is we're going to say budget. And we're also going to look whether budget is going to be an int or a float. And if it is not one of those two things, we're going to go ahead and print out invalid entry. Please enter a number, something along those lines, and then we'll exit the application. So let's say that we have a budget and we want to also know how much money is left over if we buy the shoes. So we can define something like change or what change is left over. And we could say something like self budget on this as well and we can just return our budget minus our self dot price so remember we declared self dot price up here now we're calling it and we're just saying hey i want to return the value of the budget that we have minus the cost of the item that we're purchasing okay only a couple more things and we'll be done with our class here so we also need to purchase it, right? So let's define buy and we're going to do self budget again. And here we're going to do a self 
dot budget check. And we'll check our budget. And what we'll say is if our budget is greater than or equal to self dot price, then we're going to print out. We'll do an F string here and we'll just say you can cop some and then we'll do self dot name. So the name that we'll provide here, this will all make sense once we tie it all together. Okay, and then if our budget is equal to the self dot price, then we're going to just say print out you have exactly enough money for these shoes. Otherwise, we can do else. Now we could go through this whole thing and, and give a statement and say, well, what if we had no money or what if we didn't have enough money? Uh, but in this instance, we're just going to print out the situation of you can buy these shoes and have we'll give a dollar sign here. We'll say self dot change and we'll give a budget left over. So we'll say left over just like this. All right, and then when we exit the application, we can say something like exit and we'll just give a statement. Thanks for using our shoe budget app. Now, this might not make any sense yet, and that's OK. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And so what we're doing here is we're defining our init and in our init, we have a name, which is going to be the name of the shoe and a price gonna be the price of the shoe. So self dot name is equal to name self dot price is going to be a float because we're expecting potentially it could be our price of our shoe could be $2.99 or $100.99. It, it might not just be a perfect number. So we want to use a float. We have our budget check here. We're just checking the is instance we could in theory add to this budget check and make sure we have enough funding before we come down and do the purchase would probably be the logical way to do this. But in this instance, we're just using really beginner logic and we're just coming through and we're just saying, hey, if this instance isn't an integer or a float, like somebody types in a string, then we're just gonna go ahead and reject this. We, we don't want any, we have no interest if this is no integer or float here. Then we're gonna define our change. So if we have uh, money left over, like if we have budget minus the price of the shoe, then we're going to go ahead and give some money back. Um, and then we're going to buy the shoe as well. So we're going to have our buy option. As long as our budget is greater than the price of the shoe, we can buy that shoe. And if the budget is equal to the price, then we have enough money. If it's not, then we'll actually have some money left over here, um, unless it's the instance of not having enough money. And then it'll just exit the application because we haven't told it to do anything else. And then it'll also thank us for using the shoe app. So. That's part one. We have defined the class. Now, could we build this out all in one thing? Yes, we could just write a script out for this. We could code this and make it into one easy script. But what this will do is allow us flexibility. This is where object oriented programming comes into play because we don't have to continue to repeat ourselves. And what we're following is what is called the dry approach, the don't repeat yourself approach. And so what we're doing is maintaining everything in a class here, and then we'll call that class and make it very easy on us instead of having one crazy long script that is potentially repetitive and a lot more difficult to go through. So here we're going to just open this up and I'm going to call out a shebang on bin Python three. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call this, uh, shoe purchase dot pie save that now we're going to import from our class that we made so from shoes import shoes and let's define a few variables so let's say low is equal to shoes and for the low price shoes we're just going to say we can buy some and ones and we can buy those for thirty dollars 
Uh, for medium price shoes, maybe we can purchase some Air Force Ones. And for those, maybe they're $120. And then for the high price shoes, maybe we're interested in purchasing some off whites. And those might run us $400. And from here, what we're going to do is we're going to do a try statement. Remember, we've done a try statement before. And we're going to say try. And we're going to say shoe budget is equal to a float of an input. We're going to ask for an input here. So this is all tying together. We'll say, what is your shoe budget? Do a question mark there, tie this together, and then we're going to do an exception. So if we have a value error, meaning we don't get a number back, similar to what we were doing previously, if we don't get a number back here, we're going to say, please enter a number. Now, we can come in here and say, for shoes in and then we can just give this high, medium, low, like this. We can do a shoes dot buy. And remember, we came out with this buy method over in our class here. So we're doing a shoes dot buy. It's going to go and check all this for us. And we're going to say shoe budget. So we're going to take the input of shoe budget. What's the value here? We'll take that. We'll come in here and we'll see what our budget is. If it is greater than or equal to the price of the shoe, we're defining our name of the shoe and our price of the shoe from our parameters that we defined up here, name and price. So we're saying, hey, our the name and the price. So is the price of the shoe, is it at least the amount of our budget? And if it is, we can buy that. And we'll check in the highest order and then go in the lowest order. If you flip these and you put in $400, it would just keep telling you that you can only buy the low price shoe. So you need to make sure it's in the highest to the lowest order in this, this example. And so it'll check, do we have enough money to buy the $400 pair of shoes? No, okay, and then do we have enough money to buy the $120 pair of shoes? No, do we have enough money to buy the $30 pair of shoes? So we'll go through that and iterate in this loop to see what we can or can't buy. So. Let's go ahead and save this and we'll save the shoes.py and I'm going to go ahead and run this. Hopefully I have no typos. Uh, we'll do shoe budget, shoe purchase, sorry, and run this and I do have a typo. And so if I come back in here, I forgot to close off my F string. So let me save that. Now let's try this. What is our shoe budget? So let's give it a few different options. If we said our shoe budget was $30 exactly, well, it's gonna say that we can cop some air, some and ones, sorry, and we have exactly enough money for these shoes. Thanks for using the shoe app. Uh, what if we had $31? Well, we could still cop some and ones and then we can buy these shoes and have $1 left over. All right, what if we had $450. Well, we can buy the off whites and we can buy those and have $50 left over for our budget. So hopefully this makes sense. I know this is a lot of information and this again is just a one-on-one course. So we're just kind of dabbling in the object oriented programming. And if you continue on with Python from here and you start getting into more complex material, then you could build upon what you're learning here. So try to think of something that you might want to script out like this or write out like this and think of the logic behind it. I highly recommend going and doing coding challenges or programming challenges and try to increase the logic and the ideas behind what you're trying to build. And that just takes practice. All of this takes practice. It's one thing to watch and follow along with somebody. It's a whole nother game to go out and do this yourself. So start thinking of some things that you want to build. Really use your Google skills. Look at Stack Overflow and look at some 
uh, Googling and some Redditing and just try to piece together the logic that you have in what you want to build. So highly recommend building upon this. This is a great language to learn and very flexible. And I hope that you continue on with this. So I do thank you for joining me again. If you enjoyed this experience, please do consider subscribing to the channel. We do all kinds of free courses and content. We do cybersecurity and ethical hacking related material as well. A lot of open source intelligence and operational security materials. So if you're interested in any of that, please do consider subscribing to the channel, leaving a like for this and sharing this with a friend. Word of mouth is the way that we grow and we are well on our way, hopefully to a million subscribers. At the time of this recording, we're around 355,000. So if you're watching this and we're at a million, we've done our job, but uh, we've got still quite a ways to go. So thank you again for joining me for this video. I hope it was informative for you and I hope to see you in future courses.